<laughs> Welcome, everybody. A few people coming in. Don't trip over each other on the way in the door. Nice, polite people walking in. Single file. Oh, here we go. Oh, a, a Canadian starts out the chat. Yay. Cheer up for Canadians. All right. Wow, this is uh, these people are anxious. I think this is the biggest number we've had this early. Can Canadians be polite? What do you mean, can Canadians be polite? Canadians are always polite. And, and Simon, by the way, my apologies. I lied to you yesterday. Patrick does have facial hair today. <laughs> ah, there's the, my other home, Georgia, in there. Thank you. Good to see everybody. Hope we're going to have, I'm sure we're going to have the exciting chats that we, we had in the last couple. It's gotten more and more active in the chat uh, amongst everybody when we're starting. So I've got a minute or two to go, according to my clock anyway. So let give people a little more chance to come in the door. I will be putting uh, the information about downloading Patrick's handouts uh, in the chat. So you can hold on to those questions for a moment. As soon as I uh, turn it over to Patrick to start talking, I'll be putting that information in. Or maybe John would like to put it in before that, even if there's people who are keen to download it right now. Simon, thank you for um, joining us. And our lunch and learns. I think you've actually been in the audience for most, if not all of them as well as speaking for two of them. That's great. Okay, so we're uh, about 200 people now. Maybe we'll uh, get started. We're expecting probably at least double that uh, to, to join us eventually, but sometimes people are a little slow getting started with the webinars. Switzerland. I don't know. Is that going to be the furthest one? Oh, no. Well, maybe. Hmm. I'm, I don't My geography is not very good. I couldn't tell you how far away all these people are. Rob, are you at home? Are you? You're pretty far away, I bet. Yeah, I'm down in Costa Rica. Ah, wow. Going to come visit you one of these days. Always wanted to visit Costa Rica. I got the right place for you. All right, good. All right, as long as Anton is here, we're we're good. I love that in the chat. Anton is really very helpful. He answers questions faster than I can in the chat uh, and fixes problems for people, but uh, that's good. Thank you, Anton. I think uh, Hawaii is the winner at the moment, Susan. I'm Just sorry, what? Problems. I think Hawaii is probably the winner Hawaii. distance wise at the moment. Oh, you think? Okay. Well, from us. From us, yeah. We're of course we're in Canada, so yeah, a little different from a lot of people. All right, uh, we are about a minute over, so uh, from our start time. So I'm going to give John a chance to a little quiet moment here to give him a place to um, know when to start the. He, he trims off some of this little chit chat at the beginning for the recording purposes. So, oh, another Costa Rican. There you go, neighbor Rob. We've got there. Uh, all right, here we go. We'll get started in about 30 seconds. Welcome everybody to uh, the last of this series of the Summit Lunch and Learns. I think a lot of you have been here for many of them, if not all of them. I'm sure that I know I've seen some people that are here every single time and we really appreciate your support. We also appreciate the support of our sponsors uh, like Rob Swanson and Richard Malone from CNX today. Um, they are here to, to talk to us about their very latest release that I believe has not been seen by anybody else other than uh, other than them, at least the demos. Uh, we were having our very first demo of their new release. So that's exciting stuff. Um, as usual, we have uh, three parts going here and we use several different analogies during the course of the, the series. 
So today we've decided that the uh, analogy is a meal. And so Patrick is going to be the appetizer course and the dessert course uh, after, uh, and in the middle, the actual juicy filling uh, important bits uh, is going to be all about CNX with Richard and Rob. And I think Sean is, uh, Sean Langtree is also going to be joining in on that. Remember that the chat should be used for what you're using it for now, chatting amongst yourselves, which is fine. Uh, chatting to me about things like where's the handout or you know, recordings and stuff like that, and sort of administrative kind of things. If you have a question to the speaker about the content of what they're saying, that should always go in the Q&A. That's because it's much easier for them to keep track, for everybody to keep track of what's been answered and what hasn't if it goes in the Q&A. So please remember that. And without uh, any further ado, I believe we will, I will now turn it over to Patrick, who's going to talk about, by the way, I forgot to say this, a topic that I usually talk about, I often talk about. So I am looking forward to seeing a different take on why procedures are better than subroutines. I absolutely agree that they are, but I'm not sure if I uh, uh, talk about it the same way you do. So I'm looking forward to it. All right. Well, let, well, let's check it out. Let's talk about why procedures are better than subroutines in almost all cases. So at, at the very end, we'll talk about some reasons why they might not be, but almost all the time they're going to be better. So th and there's a number of reasons, uh, ways that procedures are better. So there's how procedures are better. These are kind of superpowers that procedures have that subroutines don't. And that's going to kind of be the agenda of the things we're going to talk about. Uh, but in addition to how procedures are better and these, these specific superpowers, we really want to understand why procedures are better. And the number one reason, uh, in my opinion, is that using procedures are going to reduce reliance on global variables. And this is going to be the difference between hidden dependencies versus encapsulation and, and how we can make programs more stable and safer if we can encapsulate them. So what, what are we talking about with hidden dependencies versus encapsulation? So this is kind of a diagram of what a normal RPG program looks like. You have input parms and some, you know, global definitions, physical file, display file, subroutines. Everything in the program is shared, right? Every variable from your input parms, a display file, you know, everything is available to everything else in the program. And what can happen is if you make a change in one subroutine, you may end up causing problems in another subroutine that you thought was unrelated because, because of this these hidden dependencies and everything being in the global scope. The difference with procedures is, is we can encapsulate them and put everything that the procedure needs all in one place. And then that way we can ensure that if we make a change in one procedure, that it's not gonna cause problems in any of the others. So what does that look like? How, how does this encapsulation work? Well, let's assume that the user makes a request and the user wants to be able to enter some text into the screen. They want you to convert that into word case. Word case is where the first letter of each word is, is uppercase and then display the result back to the user. Well, since we don't have CNX valence yet, we uh, decide to go with a display file. Uh, very simple, there's just one record format and, and a single field called R1 text. And we're gonna use that both for input and for output. The program has the display file. It's very simple, all we're gonna do is just loop until the user presses F3, display the screen, and if the user has pressed enter, we're going to do the word case logic. And this is going to initially be in a subroutine. The subroutine, is, this is pretty easy. The only thing it's going to do, let me get a little bit here, we're just going to loop through and look at every single character. If it the next character, if the character is a blank, we want to uppercase the next letter. And then we're either going to convert from lowercase to uppercase or from uppercase to lowercase. And obviously I wrote this before the, the upper and lower built-in functions. So quick shout out to the, to, to the RPG folks for continuing to give us really cool biffs. Uh, but I didn't use those, uh, we're just doing translates. 
already with this really simple program that we have, we've already created a hidden dependency, right? We have this R1 text that's used in the subroutine, but it's nowhere to be found in the main section of our program, right? So it's, it's not blatantly obvious that R1 text is being used in, the, in that subroutine. Okay? The other issues is the way that we've uh, coded this what if we need to convert other fields into word case? What about R2 text or R3 text, right? We can't do that. If we needed to do that, we would have to introduce some, some other work variables and then move R2 text into a work variable, call the subroutine. The subroutine would put back into a different variable and return it back. It just gets a little bit messy if we do that. And this is something that we can deal with with using procedures very easily. So the first superpower that we're going to look at is input parameters, and we'll see how this is going to help us with our encapsulation. So we want to convert this subroutine into a procedure. So the first thing that we're going to do is convert the begin subroutine to a declare procedure statement, a declare proc, and the end subroutine becomes an end proc. Then we put our code in the middle. This, this code is pretty much exactly the same. And then we declare a procedure interface. The procedure interface is like star entry plist into our procedure. So we're declaring an input output parameter called input text, it's character 50. And the only change we've made to the code is that instead of R1 text, we're just dealing with input text here in the procedure. So once our procedure is written, in the main line, instead of calling the subroutine, we're going to call the procedure. And you do that by putting the procedure name, and then the parameters go inside of parentheses. And this is going to be very similar to an external program call, where you would say call, make word case, and send R1 text as a parameter. You put the value in there, send it in, make word case does what it does, and when you get it back, R1 text will have been changed. Okay, so and this is going to work really well uh, it, instead of the subroutine. Now, something to note, if you're new to procedures, you might need to add a, a, a header spec or a control option for default activation group star no. Now, this doesn't do anything to the program except allow you to start using ILE things like binding and procedures. So if you're going to start calling procedures, you just need to put that default activation group star no in, in your H spec or your control option. Okay, So this will also allow us to call this procedure and use it for R1 text, R2 text, R3 text, or any other variable that happens to be exactly 50 characters. Because similar to an external program call, the parameter as we've defined it requires that variable to be defined exactly as 50 characters, right? What if though we wanted to send something that was only 25 characters or maybe the substring of a field or a hard-coded value, right? How are we gonna do that? Well, we're gonna make some changes to the input parameters. The first change we're going to make is on the input text we're going to use the const keyword. This is going to make that uh, parameter, input text, is going to now be input only. It's read only, we can't change it. And because we can't change it, we need to add an output parameter as well, okay? So the program has changed a little bit. We're gonna put input text into output text and then uh, modify that variable in the program. So in our main line now, you can see that we can make word case, we can send in R1 text and put the, the modified value back in R1 text. We can send the substring of R1 text. We can send a hard-coded value. We can send in R1 text and put the converted value into a different field if we want. So we've dealt with the dependencies and we've increased the usability of the procedure, right? But, now that we've dealt with the dependencies, we kind of have the opposite problem, right? Now we have all of these variables defined in the main line of the program that aren't used in the main line of the program. They are only used 
in the procedure itself. And so this is going to be the second superpower and the second way that we're going to increase the encapsulation is by using local variables. And this is really cool. I really like being able to do this. So we have all of these definitions defined at the top of the program in the global spec. If they're only used inside of our procedure, what we can do is simply move them all down and define them inside the procedure itself. Okay, so now we have our declare procedure, the input param input output parameters, right? The declare procedure interface. You can have locally defined variables, and then your code. Right? What this is going to do for you, there's there's some advantages to having all of your variables defined inside of the procedure. The first is that these variables are going to be very easy to find because they're defined right there in the procedure itself. You don't have to go hunting for where they're defined. The second advantage and, and what helps us the most with the encapsulation is that any variables that are defined inside the procedure can only be used inside of that procedure. They're not visible to any other part of the program. Okay? The third is that it's going to clean up the main line of the program. So now in the main line of our program, we don't have any hidden dependencies, right? Remember when we first started, our one text was used in the subroutine, but we didn't see that in, in the main line, okay? So we've gotten rid of the hidden dependencies and we have gotten rid of all of the unused global variables. So it, it really helped clean that up. Right? So by using input parameters and local variables, we've encapsulated all of that logic inside of the make word case procedure itself. And we can ensure that none of the variables and logic that's inside of that procedure can be affected by any of the other procedures. It is encapsulated inside of there. Now, there are a number of other superpowers and a lot more functionality that we're going to go through in the second half uh, in the dessert portion. Uh, but for now, I think it's time to turn it back over and, and hear from Rob and Richard. Okay, hi everybody, can you see me? Patrick? I. So Sorry. I see you. Sorry, I wasn't exactly 100% <laughs> <I>, ready. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I, yeah, it, it wasn't quite 15 minutes, so I apologize for that. No, no problem. Um, let me uh, try to share my screen here, and that should take over the presentation. All right, there we go. Uh, this screen here. Sorry, I have, to, I have to move some things around on my screen so it doesn't cover up the view of the presentation. All right, I think I'm ready to go. Um, first, before we get started, you know, it's really our pleasure to sponsor this Lunch and Learn series. I, I don't usually stop and take a moment to thank John and Susan for putting this on, but I'd like to do that now. Uh, thank them for you know, hosting this. And uh, we've done this many times, uh, done this demo of valence through these lunch and learns. It's always very well attended. The questions are always great from people. And, um, you know, for the audience, I would really encourage you to, uh, like, follow, replay the video when you get the video link, uh, share it with friends or talk to people about joining this series. Uh, I think it's really super helpful for the community. And uh, if you've seen this demo of Valence before, there's a lot of people on here right now. So I assume there are some that have seen this before or are already familiar with Valence. Please stick around. This one's going to be a special one. We're going to have some really cool things to show you on this one. So uh, just do some introductions here. Um, Patrick, and, and, and also on the information about the Lunch and Learn, it was supposed to be Rob Swanson and myself. Rob is on, but he's going to be doing Q&A answers only. Um, I'm going to be doing like the, the hosting portion of the CNX portion, and I'm the co-founder and managing director of CNX. And so I'm going to do like a quick overview for people to tell you what Valence is. And I'm going to talk about the anatomy of a Nitro app. If you don't know what that is, don't worry. I'm going to explain that. 
And then also we have Sean Langtree on as well. And he is our uh, director of professional services and he also does our training. So he's like the perfect guy to do a demonstration. He's gonna create an IBMI app from scratch and there's like a really cool twist on it, uh, which is sort of a surprise I'll talk about in the last slide of this presentation. So <clears throat> for those of you who have never heard of Valence, don't know what it is, Basically, if you had to you know, sum it up in one sentence, it's a suite of development and runtime software that handles all IBM I application needs, okay? So if you're a developer involved with the development, it's got everything in there you need to develop modern applications, but it also has all the stuff you need to do the runtime as well. If you create a web-based application for your users, you know, how are you going to deploy that to your end users? How are you going to deploy it only to certain users? How are they going to log in? How are you going to manage sessions? All that stuff is included in Valence. And it is native to the IBM I. A majority of all the services on the back end are provided by RPG web services, basically. So it is native to IBM I. Um, I do mention this because I had so many questions in the past over these demos about people. People would ask me like, well, there must be some kind of Windows server external to the IBM I doing all this. Nope, there's no external servers required. Valence is super easy to install. You just install it to your IBM I, and then you go to the URL to log in, and you'll see that in, in our demo. So no external servers, and you do have to have IBM I 7.2 or higher. All right. So sometimes I, I take some time to describe all of these. I'm not going to go through all of these because I'm really excited to get to the demo portion. So I'm just going to like list all these out and then just talk about a few of them. So the valence portal is what I mentioned earlier. That's going to handle user logins, session management, um, role-based security, like what certain users only get access to certain applications and things like that. That's what the valence portal is. And that there's administrative tools for, for the admin, whoever's administering, and then there's the, the part that the users use. So that's a really important piece. Um, I'll jump down and talk about the Fusion 5250. That is a, a web-based emulator that runs right within Valence. Uh, we have a lot of customers that like deploy old green screen applications to you know Chrome, uh, Chromebooks and things like that. Um, and you know, we have customers that like have new modern valence applications, but they still have like old applications that they need to run side by side. So it allows you to run old and new simultaneously in the same sort of like valence ecosystem. So that's why we have that there. I mentioned like a lot of other utilities. There's a lot of features here that are not listed like Excel generations, PDF, spool file viewers for users to look at spool files. Everything can be done through the web interface, okay? Um, and of course, I put a star next to Nitro App Builder because that's the tool that we are going to use to do the uh, application today. And that really is the feature within Valence that drives most of our sales. Like when customers um, and companies are looking at Valence to solve their problems, all the other things that Valence has in it are needed, right? They're sort of like the, the supporting cast, right? But what is driving them to look at Valence is really the Nitro App Builder. They need to be able to create applications, good modern applications, quickly and efficiently. And that's what the Nitro App Builder does. So that's why it has a star. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about the Nitro App Builder. Um, it's really classified as like a low code builder, right? You can, with no coding, create user interface elements like what's listed here, charts, maps, other components, anything visual we call that a widget in, in, in our terminology with no programming. You just use the web interface to, to do this as a programmer. Then in order to get what we call a Nitro app, you can take any of these visual elements and put them on a canvas and they become an application. And then we have what we call behaviors, which are really just like actions that the user can take. Okay, so if you have a button on the screen or, or on the page and the user clicks that button, well, what happens? Does, does some uh, list of things update? Does a map update? You know, that's, we call those behaviors. So once you do all that and put that together as an application, then you can deploy those applications through the valence portal. And that's how your users will interact with those applications. Okay. So that's a really super simplified, you know, what is Nitro App Builder? 
Um, I really like talking about the why do we have something like Nitra App Builder? Because over the years, maybe it's tapering off a little bit, but over the years, I have a lot of developers come to me after seeing a Nitra App Builder demonstration to be like, I'm a developer, I write code, okay? Um, I, why I don't want to use something like a Nitra App Builder? Well, <laughs> uh, over the years, we found that, okay, you can do everything you know, manually if you want, but in our experience, it takes far too long, right, to create and deploy applications that are really truly modern for your IBM I users. And, you know, in our experience, you know, businesses, the companies you're working for, the expectations have changed so much over the years. They really expect things to be done quickly. What used to take years or months, now it's expected the expectation is that it can be done in hours. And if you can't do it, somebody else will be able to do it faster and more efficiently. Right. So we need to, as developers, really use more tools. The stuff that Patrick was talking about in the code is also very important. You need to understand the low level things of what's going on in many cases. Right. But in order to be more productive, you need to use tools like Nitra App Builder. So another reason is like truly modern user interfaces. If we're being honest with ourselves, you know, we, we, we see a lot of products in the IBM I space that call themselves, you know, modernization tools, but then the output of them is really something that looks like it was produced in like 2005 or something, really not super modern looking, right? Really modern user interfaces require a high skill set to be able to do that and do have a long learning curve. And, uh, you know, I don't know what your experience is, but like we have found that development resources or good development resources are scarce. And if you do find good development resources, they're usually expensive. So, Nitro App Builder and tools like Nitro App Builder are helping companies do more with less, right? That's what we're all trying to achieve here. So now I'm going to move into a little bit of technical explanation just to sort of set up Sean's demo a little bit more technically. So when we're creating a Nitro app, the first thing you're going to see Sean do is to create a data source. And I'm not talking about like creating a data table or anything like that. I'm talking about more of like creating, how do you get to the data, like the SQL statement, okay? Um, or you can use a wizard in, in Valence to create what we call a data source. That's really just the definition of where is my data, okay? And then once you have that set up in, in Valence Nitro App Builder, then you can attach those visual elements we call widgets, right? So in this case here, we have a grid widget, which is really sort of like a subfile, just a list of things, or you can attach a chart to it. And this is showing that, hey, you can have more than one graphical element attached to the same data source, okay? And then once you have some widgets defined, you can have one or more of those go into then creating a Nitro app. It's also important to know you can have an unlimited number of data sources and you know they can all uh, go into a, a, a num any number of data sources and widgets attach different data sources and they can all go into the same Nitro app. And individual graphical elements can participate in more than one Nitro app. Like for example, you can have like a, Say you have a map widget where uh, that's tracking like the locations of trucks around the city. Um, you know, and you may have that participating in multiple different applications where users may need to see where that where that is, and you only, so you only have to maintain that widget one time. All right, now I'm going <clears> to <throat> sort of rearrange the list of things a little bit here to put the app level in the upper left, so I can talk about the behaviors. So a behavior, just like I talked about earlier, is sort of like an action that the user can take, right? So in this example, like let's say the user clicks on a bar that may be on a chart widget. Well, once the user clicks that, it could update a list. You know, um, another behavior could be like if they clicked on a row on a grid, maybe that updates a map. Like say maybe the grid had like an address in there, and now we're showing that address on the map. And then finally, another example could be. Suppose there's a button on the grid widget, and then I can call some special operation in RPG, something outside the base graphical capabilities of Nitro App Builder. You can just write that in manual code, and then it can call that process. Or it could be something you have existing already. All right. So that's sort of like the technical setup. And now I'm going to announce, for those of you who have stuck around because I gave a little uh, teaser on this at the beginning about a special announcement. We have something new coming out um, this month in Valence 6.3. We're calling the Valence Assistant. 
And this is an AI service provided by CNX. Super excited about this. It'll become available in Vanwant 6.3. Should be released within the next few weeks. I'm not giving a complete, a specific date on it because anytime I put out a date, it, we always slip or something. It's never the exact date. We're just saying within the next few weeks, we're, we're crossing the T's and dotting the I's as they say. Um, and right here on this demo, on this uh, lunch and learn session, we're going to be demoing it for the first time. Now we've we've shown some close customers that we work with and trialed this, uh, you know, privately. But this will be the first time we're really doing it sort of publicly. And also, what you'll see in this demo is really just just the beginning. Okay, um, it's super useful today, and then. Over time, we'll probably be adding a lot more things as as we see how customers use it and, and where we can help. So for years, Valence, and especially the Nitro App Builder, has been an excellent tool for assisting the user and the developer in being more productive. And now this Valence, Valence Assistant just takes it to a whole new level, OK? And I think you'll see that like uh, creating SQL statements becomes like really super easy, especially if you're not really if you're if your person is not super comfortable in SQL or it takes you a long time to create an SQL statement, this could be really helpful. If you're not great at like laying out form fields and things like that, the the valence assistant can be super helpful. So I know AI is like all the rage, right? Everybody's trying to do AI this and AI that, and we're trying to be really super practical with it and then implement it in ways that we really feel will help the developer be more productive. We're not just throwing out AI just for the sake of AI, we're really only implementing it where we see it will lead to productivity increases. Okay, so now it's time for the demo. And so I'm just gonna remind everybody in the Q&A, as Sean is doing the demo, I will monitor the Q&A and I'll sort of answer questions as Sean, I may even stop Sean and ask him to clarify something or whatever. So you can post things in the QA to me. And, um, just for like a minute or two, I'm going to show a brief demo of the Valence portal just to get things started off, and then I'll transition to Sean. So let me end the presentation here and flip to my browser. Okay, so I'm at the login page. This is Valence 6.2. Sean will be demoing 6.3. I didn't want to mess with Sean's environment there, so I'm in... This is sort of the stable version of, of Valence right now, the one we already have out on our website if you try to download it. Um, and this is the Valence portal. And you can see we have multiple languages uh, here. You know, if you wanted to switch it to Spanish, everything would switch to Spanish. And uh, when you logged in, everything would be in Spanish. Um, that's just one of the features that's built in. So I'm just going to go ahead and log in here. And so I am an administrator. So I see everything. So each one of these little, we call these tiles. So each one of these little squares is a tile, and that represents launching an app just like you would on your smartphone, right? An icon represents launching an app. And since I'm an administrator, I have like portal administration here and here's all my settings for valence. I can administer users. I can administer different applications, uh, all these different things. There's many different ways to administer the portal. Um, this is what we call valence instance manager. So uh, we use this system for training. So the, the, all the, these squares here represent different instances, which are logical separate instances of valence running on the same logical partition. And you can manage those differently. Active sessions of users. I'm not going to click into every single one of these. Um, if the system encounters any errors, uh, you know, they'll be recorded in here. Uh, you get statistics on user applications. Uh, how, you know, how you users are using the applications and statistics around that. There's really an awesome full-blown file editor, which, you know, by itself is really an amazing feature, but this is just sort of, oh, these utilities are just sort of like thrown in with valence um, to increase productivity. And to, as, like I said earlier, our goal is to sort of keep you in the valence environment, not have to bounce around to a lot of different things. So we try to include as many tools as we can. So for example, you can just go into um, a table you know, you can do all this with SQL, but this is just sort of like a productivity tool, right? You can go into records and maintain records and things like that. Obviously, you probably don't want to deploy that to your end users. That's an administrative tool. There's the Nitro App Builder, which Sean will demonstrate. Um, spool File Viewer is like a really cool thing to be able to, you can deploy this to your users. And since this is a test system, I don't have a lot of outcues on here. But as you can see, I can just go in 
and look at this job log um, and see it right on the screen. I can download it to a PDF. I can then email it to somebody. You know, that that's sort of another built-in feature. Users love this to be able to just get their spool files, you know, on their own and pass them around an email and things like that. There's the Fusion 5250, which uh, is surprisingly popular, especially for companies that want to deploy a lot of old applications to uh, like Chromebooks and things like that, um, because it, it really scales well. Like you have thousands of users on this because it does not use Java. It uh, is sort of like a native emulator that running in the browser. Uh, we could spend a whole session just on a lot of these different features. So I'm just sort of going through them quickly. Um, we also have some example Nitro apps in here. Um, like for example, you know, this is like an order entry app where you can say, okay, for this list of customers, I can say, okay, I'm adding a new order for this customer. And this is where the customer is located. I picked a customer that had no location, of course, <laughs> on the map. Uh, there's 81 orders that are late and that's the list of orders. So that's sort of like an order management app. Um, there's like a sales dashboard example. All of the colors you see here and the layout, all this is totally modifiable. And if you're not that great of a user interface designer, like if you're an old school RPG program or whatever, we try to make things as clear as possible for that audience. Okay. So like as an old, if you're an old school RPG developer, you've been using IBM I for a long time, or if you've tried to implement uh, different modernization things in the past, we try to make this all like feel right to you like it's the right way of doing it and uh you know we 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 have a lot of things in here that make it just make sense for people like that um let's see i think i've shown everything that i wanted to show briefly and sean is going to take it over now and go into the nitro app builder and uh create an app for us what do you think sean okay can you see my screen yes Okay. Okay. Well, as Richard mentioned, I will be doing the demo and I'm going to, I'm going to give as much explanation as I can, as I'm doing this stuff, but time constraint, you know, I want to get everything done. So I'm going to be kind of flying through this stuff. <laughs> um, I want to show you first, I created some uh, wireframes of, of what we're going to create first. So this is an application called products. We have a list of products and we have a, a bar chart showing top sales. If I click a product will pop up a window that shows more information about that product. Um, as Richard mentioned earlier, you know, we have data sources, widgets, and then an application. The application will be products. I'm gonna create a data source called products. And then off of that data source, we'll create a product list. I just wanted to get that clear first so you could kind of uh, understand what we're doing, what we're trying to build first. So. I'm going to log in and I'm going to click the Nitro App Builder application. So upon starting Nitro App Builder, you have two sections, data sources and widgets. And we're, we're going to work in data source and widgets first. I need to create my first data source. So if I click this plus button, there, there are a couple of ways to create data sources. We could do like a wizard type setup. Um, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to click add data source and here we can type in any SQL statement. I'm going to use, as Richard was mentioning earlier, the, the valence assistant to help me here. So the first part of this is it's asking me, do I want to pass some file definitions? So this isn't data. It's just passing the definition of the file. In other words, the, 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 the column name and the column description. So we have a table called VX products. So I'm going to, send that it gives me the list of everything you know that that it'll pass you know if i say oh don't don't include this field i can uncheck it um in my data source i want to have all products and then i want to get the, I, I also want the total sales of the products and the total on hand inventory so i'm also going to include an order detail file and then i'm also going to include an inventory file so now i press continue so here, you know, we just kind of describe it and give some samples of what, you know, what, what you might, what you might ask. Um, I'm going to ask, I'm just going to paste this in. So save myself some typing here. I want all product columns. 
And I want a total of sales, quantity sold, and the on-hand inventory for each product. So let me just ask it. So this is interpreting you know, my file structures now and hopefully coming up with a useful SQL statement. So it did. Um, you know, it was smart enough to say, oh, let me do the mappings here. And I can also go back and forth with it. Like I might say, yeah, you know, uh, I want to use, use subqueries instead of the summary columns. You know, so now we'll take that statement and hopefully, you know, change it how I asked. So let me just give it a second here and wait. And okay. So I'm just going to click copy and paste. It's going to bring it in and I'm going to go to preview. So that gave me my data source. I'm going to save this and I'm going to call it products. So now you see we have a data source called products. I can create widgets off of my data source. So I'm going to go to create widget. First, I'll click here and just show you. Here are the various widgets you can create. I'm going to create a grid. Because remember, what I'm creating is this. I'm going to create this list here. So I'll include product. It's asking me what columns do you want to include in your list? Description, UPC code, uh, class, unit of measure, and let's say price. I'm just going to go here to take a look and see. This is kind of a, a, this is a preview of what it'll look like. And I might want to change some things. I don't, I don't like the, uh, the heading of unit of measure. I want to shorten it, make it UOM, and I want this to be formatted as money. So I'll just click in here, do UOM. Maybe I'll center align it on my price. I'll go to formatting, and then we have all sorts of built-in formatters. I'm going to choose this money. Let's just take a look at it. Okay, looking better, I'm going to remove paging. Notice it's paging my results, and then I'm gonna add a search. So I'm just gonna add a built-in search here. So that way I could type in and you know it'll limit my results. So let's just save this as product list. Now I'm gonna go to apps. I'm gonna create our app in stages. So apps, add app. First thing it's asking me, what widget do you want? What widgets? I only have one. I'm going to add it. I'm going to put an app art title called products, and I'm going to save this. I'm taking all the defaults. This kind of gets into what Richard was alluding to earlier with administration. We could change all this later, but I'm just taking all the defaults. And now I should have this products app available. So here's my products apps. And it doesn't really do much now. It's just a grid, right, that I can search. So... Let's create this now. So I'm going to create a new data source called product sales summary, and I'm going to create a bar chart over that. So going back into app builder, and I'm going to go to the data source and widgets, and I'm creating another new data source. Okay. And in this case, I will, um, let's see here. I'll, I'll use the, uh, I'll use the assistant again. So VX products. And then I also want order detail. And per product, give me the total sales for the current year. And how about the previous, the previous year? Order the data, sorry, order the data by sales descending for the current year. Okay, let's see it. I think that looks good. So let's just preview the data and it looks like I'm getting by product, current year sales and previous year sales. Good, so let me save this. And I will call it product sales summary. So now right away, I'm going to create that bar chart against it. So I'm going to go to create widget, charts, a bar chart. Okay. So charts, what are the data fields? Well, I want the uh, current year sales. I want the previous year sales. And my label will be product. So now to lay the chart out, 
I'm going to limit it to the first 10 results. Okay. And I'm going to put a title on this and call it top sales. And this, this data here should be money. So I'll represent it as money. So I'll go to data access and click the formatting, make it money. And I'll put a legend on here as well. So the legend will go up top. This will be called current year, and this will be called previous year. Okay, and let's just save it. And we will call this the product sales bar. Okay, so now I have you know another widget. So I'm gonna go back to my app and I'm gonna just click the app to go in edit mode and I'm gonna add my other widget. So I'm just gonna click add product sales. It's gonna put it to the bottom but now I can hover over and I'll get arrows to move it. Yeah, I want to move it up. Okay. And I'm going to go to settings here and I can you know, adjust the margin. I'm just going to make the, the left margin zero here. And let's see, let's, let's put a theme on the app too. I'm going to go to theming and I'm going to make it uh, this one. Save. Let's save the app. So now I want to reload. I want to reload this app. I want to run it again. I can close the app and, and, and run it again. And that should look different. Okay, so now we got our two widgets. So now I need to put in this part. When I click, we show a pop-up window, right? So if I go back, sorry, I'm gonna use the same data source, but I'm gonna create a new widget called product form. So back to app builder, back to data source and widgets, products, create widget, form. Okay, so typically the form, you select the fields you want, I'll just do that quickly to show you. I might say, yeah, you know, I want these to be editable, um, you know, and it kind of just lays it out. I can group the fields if I wanted to, but I'm not going to do any of that. I'm just going to use the valence assistant to just try and do its best. Okay. So um, I'm just going to uncheck this and just let it do its thing. So let's, uh, I just want to give it like a, a brief explanation of what I wanted to do. So use all available columns. Um, this form is showing attributes of a product. Uh, group, group it as you see fit. And then I don't know, maybe feel free to change field labels. You know, like maybe it doesn't like standard costs, it's gonna change it. All right, let's just see what we get. So it's it, it knows about all of our data here and it's going to try and group it appropriately. Um, let's see, so when it comes back, there we go. So, you know, it kind of gave me this, this object showing me what it wants to do. And all the way at the bottom here, I could just hit apply. I'm gonna hit apply and it did something and let's see what happens. Okay, so it, so it changed it for me, okay? You know, I, might, I, can, I can then further refine it. Like I might change the number of columns here to just say one to just go top down. I could have chatted back and forth with the assistant to tell it to do it, but I didn't. Um, I'm just going to refine this a little bit, like maybe on our pricing fields, you know, I'll, I'll format it as money, like standard cost should be money. Um, default price should be money and sales should be money. And let's just see what it looks like. Okay, let's save it. Product form. Okay, I'm going back to the app. I'm going to incorporate it. I'm going to add a widget. I'm going to hover over. I'm going to add it as a pop-up. So now when I click this row, I want that pop-up to show. Richard mentioned behaviors earlier. I'm going to go into behaviors. No time to explain this, but here's my product list. On a row click, it does nothing. No action. Well, I want it to filter a widget. What widget do you want it to filter? The form. Okay, tell me the relationship of how do I filter this data down? Well, I know my database. It's product to product. Save, save, save. And I'm going to rerun my app. I'm going to do a shortcut 
If I right click and do reload frame, it's the same thing as me closing it and opening it. So now let's see, when I click this, good, got it. Let's go to step two. I wanna change this a little bit. Now when I click, I wanna to go to a whole new section with some more data. And then it, this just kind of takes me back, back and forth, okay? So I'm going back into App Builder and we are going to create yet another data source. We're gonna create one that has inventory. This time I'm just gonna do it like this. Select star from VXINV. No, you know, I don't wanna overkill, no reason to use the assistant here. Product inventory, I'll call it. And I will create a grid off of this. So uh, let's take warehouse, aisle, row, tier, and on hand, I'll change the field labels. Call this row, tier. Um, I'm going to set all the widths to be equal. And I'm going to center align these. And I want to summarize the on hand, the on hand quantity. I want to total it up. Okay. So let's just see what this looks like so far. Okay. I'm going to remove paging. And how about we give it a title of inventory? Okay, save. This is the product inventory list. Okay, now I wanna create a uh, kind of like a sales breakdown. So if I go back, I wanna create a sales breakdown of this product. So I'm gonna go back into a data source and widgets. And once again, I'm gonna use this, the assistant because this is kind of a complicated statement. Um, I know I need my order header. I know I need my order detail. Oop, I think I had a space there. And I also want my customer header because I want to be able to extract the customer name. And let me continue. And let's say, let's, um, let's summarize product sales and quantities by customer name and year. So basically I want, I want five columns. I want the customer name, the order year, the product, how about total QTY and total sales. So it should honor those names that I gave it and you know actually make those the, 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 the column names. At least that's the hope. Let's see. All right. Uh, looks looks good to me. Let me copy and paste it in. Let's preview it. Okay. Let's save it. I'm going to call this the product product sales breakdown. And then I'm going to create my grid off of this. So right away, I'm going to create a grid. And let's see. Let's uh, let's include the customer, the year the quantity and the sales. I don't need to include the product because I'm going to go into the product. So we'll call this customer, we'll call this year. Uh, let me center align it. Uh, I'm going to put some hard coded widths on these, 150 pixels each, we'll say. And this will be quantity and this will be sales. I want to total up the quantity. I want to total up, total up the, the summary. And let's just put some formatters. I'll, I'll put a formatter on the quantity as well. I want it com I want commas in my numbers, let's say. And let's go to configure and we'll give it a uh, a title of sales breakdown, let's say. Sales breakdown. And I will remove paging. And I think that's good. I think that's what we want. Let's uh, save it. Product sales breakdown list. Now I'm going to add these into my app. So first thing I want to do is I'm, I'm going to add an entirely new section. An app can have more than one section. I just created a detail section, and then we also had our main section. Every app has a main section. So I'm going to go into my detail section, and I'm going to add the widgets that I want. So just to refresh ourselves, you know, we started here. I click. I want to go into a new screen, a new section. I'm going to reuse my product form. 
And I'm going to put in my two new widgets here, and I'm going to have a back button to go back. Okay. So I'm in my detail section, which is blank right now. I'm going to click Add Widget. I can go to current widgets and say, well, yeah, actually, I want to move this current product form into this, into this uh, section. So I'm just going to click that. And now I'm going to add widget. I'm going to add a utility widget here just to show you different things. We can have a vertical layout. I'm just going to give it a name of right because it's going to be on the right hand side of the screen. Now I can move that. So now I'm going to add this is think of this as a parent. I'm going to add my two widgets into this parent here. OK, let me just go to the settings here. I'm just going to remove some just clean up my margins a little bit. OK, I'll put a zero margin here. OK, so now that's kind of that's looking like what we want. So now when I click this list, I need to you know make it go to that section. So that's back in behaviors. If I go to my product list, we already have that filter widget from the product form, right? So that, that one's good. But I have two other widgets I want to filter down now. My product inventory, which will be product to product. And then I want to also filter down my product sales breakdown. And if I look down here, there's product, product, save. And then I'm going to do another. There's all sorts of actions you could do. One of them, the thing I want to do here is I want to show section detail, okay? And I also want to add a back button to my detail section. So I can just click here, add button. I don't want any text. I'm just going to choose a nice icon, like a back icon. I'm going to put it at the top, align it to the left, save, on click, show previous section, save, save. And let's retry it. Okay, here we go. All right, back. Okay, these totals should all match. We got the 24036, the 8883885, the total on hand. So there we go. We, I, I'm happy we got through both iterations of, of the app. I know I flew <laughs> and didn't give much explanation, but there's a, you know, there's a lot more you can do. We're just creating a simple display only dashboard. So. Any questions? Uh, Sean, I did have a question from the Q&A section uh, that maybe you could talk about. It doesn't have anything to do with the AI stuff, but it's about uh, change management. Um, somebody was asking, uh, somebody named Dean has asked, uh, like, if you have an app in development, mm -hmm. how would you move that to like QA and live? Yeah. Uh, would you mind just yeah. showing that? Sure. So. I'm an app builder, and as Richard showed earlier, if you remember, he went into the instance manager. So let's just see, do we have, we do have, we have some instances here. So I'm in the VV Demo 6.3. There are two other instances. There's a base instance, and then I, we have this other VV Serve 6. So let's just pretend I'm in the development instance, which is demo, and let's pretend this is the QA instance, VV Serve 6. There's a number of ways I could do this. I can go to export to instance. And what that'll do is that'll export the application into that other instance. And it's just telling me what it's going to do. Um, you know, alternately, if it's, let's say it's on another system, I could just export the save file. You know, showing testing, I'm just putting a note. And this will create a save file. So this is a save file that I could move to another system. I can see it here too. Like you will be able to see, this is the one I just created, this, this save file here. So yeah, we have ways of, you know, exporting apps, widgets, data sources. You know, this is all, I'm at a data source now. I could do it at that level too. I'll just uh, add to that as well, that uh, there is like an exit program too, that you can use to call your own, maybe existing change management system or, um, you know, if you have to, if you have to like register something, there's an exit program for that, for, for that integration. Um, and I also wanted to say like, as I was watching Sean go through that, you know, it's amazing to me as a, as a valence developer, like 
part of my job is I work with customers to develop applications or help them develop applications with Balance and Nitro App Builder. And just like, I am just so blown away by how fast you can do like the SQL statements and then also lay out forms. And maybe it's not perfect on the first call, but then you can adjust it. Like it's unbelievable time saver. Um, and I really, just personally speaking, I really want to get this to as many customers as I'm working with it as quickly as possible because the productivity increase is going to be incredible. So Sean, can I just ask you, like, yeah. this, is real, this is really the first time that you've done a demo where there was no pre-defined components. Like uh, normally what we do in a, like a 10 minute creation of, a, of, of an app is we'll create a grid or something, something that's like fast, right? Like you've got things here where, you know, you've got a grid, you've got a form, like how much time would it have taken you to, even using Nitro App Builder, to have created all of this with all of the, the headings and the chart and the form and the form layout and the SQL statements, like how just thinking of how long you took, how much time would it have taken to do this manually? Oh, like a manually coded application? Yeah. No, no, like in Nitro App Builder without the AI without the valence oh, without assistant. the AI. Without the valence assistant. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm I mean, you on this I mean, in, a little bit. Yeah. Right? I mean, in, in this case, you know, I mean, those SQL statements were fairly simple. Uh, mm -hmm. but it it does help. And then, you know, that form. So like the we've worked with forms that have hundreds of columns. And and that's a real pain to uh to to organize. And not only that, sometimes we're working on a customer system and we don't know their business. And I don't know in the insurance term of, you know, X, Y, Z, but that does. So mm -hmm. it, it does a good job of, of grouping things. So in, in, in terms of like a form, like it, it could save me hours, mm -hmm. that day, let's say, you know, and then do it in 20 seconds. So, but yeah, I mean, like you said, it's all new. So I don't, I don't have a great grasp on everything right now. I know it saves time. <laughs> uh, yeah. Like I just, uh, as I was watching you do this, like you're just sort of nonchalantly going through and you've created this SQL statement that's summarizing columns and then right. getting this form layout. And I'm just like, wow, that's like incredible, you know, and I, I'm usually downplaying everything. I'm like, just show the features and customers will decide on their own. But like, I personally am really excited about using this at customer sites. So I Maybe think I can sell you a license, Richard. You'll sell me a license, a personal yeah. license. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. I would say, uh, I think, Sean, if you're finished, we can let Patrick uh, yes. go. Um, but real, I don't... real quick, uh, guys, uh, there's been a couple questions about examples, and I don't think you had a chance to show that on the portal. Maybe, Sean, you could just kind of show that there's a bunch of pre-built example apps out there. Yeah. And we haven't even talked about calling RPG programs and stuff, which is a big part of, of it, obviously, as an IBMI developer. Yeah. All right. Um, Sean, would you just for, um, just so people know, and we're seeing your screen at the moment, could you just go to cnxcorp.com so I can point out a few things? So if anybody wants to try Valence, you can just go to cnxcorp.com, click Downloads. Right now you can trial Valence 6.2, which is the, the top one on the list. So you, if you just download it and follow the Valence installer, it's very easy to install and get started. And that'll help you, you know, you can play around with all the features in Nitro App Builder. It will not have the Valence Assistant in it. That is coming with Valence 6.3. But if you download the software and we should have your email address from attending this uh, Lunch and Learn, you're gonna get a follow-up from us um, I would say the most would be a few weeks, but probably sooner saying that Valence 6.3 is available. Then you can come and download that as well, and it'll just upgrade your 6.2 to 6.3, and then you can use the Valence Assistant uh, features. So we can turn it back to, to Patrick. And then uh, if anybody has any questions uh, about what you saw Sean do or about Valence, I'll be happy to you know, stay on and answer those. All right, just trying to find all of my buttons and make sure I'm not muted and all of that sort of stuff. Thank you, guys. That was really uh, awesome uh, presentation. Looking forward to trying out that the AI stuff. That looks cool. 
All right. So uh, we were talking about procedures and why they are better than subroutines. We talked about encapsulation and, and how that can help make our program safer. And now we want to move on to the second reason why procedures are better. And it could, because it can help with the readability, clarity, and maintainability. And we don't have to spend hours or days trying to figure out what our programs are doing. Right. So the users were very happy with the make word case program that we wrote. And so now they have another request. They want us to trim the leading and trailing blanks off of what they enter. And they want us to, to tell them what the length of the remaining string is. Right. So there's a few different ways we can go about this. We could use subroutines, but we're, we're, we're trying to not use the subroutines. So we might use a couple of procedures right, send in the value, get the trimmed value from that, and then send the trimmed value into another procedure and get the length from that. But hopefully everyone's looking at this and, and just kind of going, well, why wouldn't you just use percent length and percent trim? And that is the probably the best way to go uh, because it's the cleanest, easiest, clearest way to accomplish the task, which means that the program is going to be much more maintainable and understandable in the future, right? The way that this works though, uh, for clarity is, is because of return values. Those built-in functions are returning values and, and used as input parameters into the next built-in function. So this is the third superpower of the procedures is being able to return values. So what's really happening when we are using percent length of percent trim is first the percent trim is going to be called, right? And we have space, 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 one, two, three, four, five, space, space, space. So percent trim is going to be called and that will return back the value without the leading and, and trailing blanks. And then what's left is going to be sent as an input parameter into percent length, which returns a value, which is then going to be assigned to the length variable, right? So it's kind of understandable, but just it's important that we break this into parts because what we're going to do is create our own procedures to do this same exact thing. So we're going to create procedures called get length and get trim, okay? First, we want to call get trim. And what this is going to look like is we're going to accept an input parameter. We're going to cheat and we're just going to use percent trim. This is an exercise on return values, not on how to trim text. So we're, we're kind of cheating a little bit. But notice here in our procedure interface, we have defined a data type on the declare PI statement. This means that this procedure is going to return a value of that data type. So we've defined locally a trimmed value variable. We set the value equal to the trim of whatever was sent in. And then when we are ready, we use the return opcode and we return back the trimmed value from the procedure. That value would then get sent into our get length procedure. And now this is going to operate exactly the same way. And we're going to cheat just like we did before. We're going to use percent length. Notice here that we have a different data type. This procedure is going to return back a packed two instead of a varcar 50. Right? And it also accepts in a varcar 50. Right? So same thing. We declare a local variable called length. We use percent length to figure out the length. And then when we're ready, we simply return that value from our procedure. And then that would get sent, uh, assigned into our length variable. Okay, so now, now that we know that we can return values from our procedure, we can go back to the first example. And instead of using two different parameters, we can simply use a return value to make the code even clearer and, and more understandable. So now what we're saying is R1 text is equal to whatever make word case returns to us, and we send in R1 text as the input parameter. Right? So here we have no unused global variables, no hidden dependencies, and with the return value, we get extra clarity and understanding. Okay? 
The third reason why procedures are better is because we get some really cool functionality that we're going to take a look at next. The first one is on exit. Now, on exit in in RPG world is somewhat new. It was introduced in 2016 uh, for version 7.2 and 7.3. So it's been around for a while. Um, if you're not familiar with it, 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 this is if you have code that you always, always have to run, no matter what happens in your procedure, you put that in the on exit section. Now, what kind of things might that be? Well, you might want to close open files, delete temporary files, de deallocate storage, write to a log file. We can check if something bad happened to get a program dump or change a return value. Things that we have to make sure always happen no matter what. Okay. So for example, I have this great divide by procedure and you send in a value and I'm going to take one and divide it by whatever you send in. Okay. So if we call, start calling this procedure, we can divide by one and get one, divide by two and get 0.5, divide by 10 and get 0.1. And then if we send in zero, we're going to cause a program error. We're going to divide by zero. Okay. This is not really great programming, but it's really great to uh, demonstrate the on exit functionality. So what we're doing here in our procedure, we've added an on exit section in between the return value and the end procedure. Okay? We have also declared a variable called was abnormal end. And this is just a local variable in the procedure. And this will be filled out, uh, populated automatically by the operating system. If something bad happened, if it's ending abnormally with a divide by zero, for example, it will automatically set that indicator to on. And so we can check for that in our on exit. And that's what we're doing here. If something bad happened, if there was an abnormal end, we're going to log into our logging file that something bad happened. Otherwise, we will log that it ended normally. So if we call our program again, you can see that in, in our log file, we have ended normally, ended normally, ended normally, and then something bad happened. Now, it's not going to stop your program from have ending and you know not working correctly, but at least you have an opportunity to do things uh, if something unexpected does happen. So the on exit section is really good. I often put my closed cursors in there. The other thing that you get with procedures is recursion. Now, what happens when you call the main line, you're going to have a couple of entries on your call stack. Now, from your main line, you can call your procedure and notice that it, it adds an entry to the call stack. What's cool with procedures is your procedure can call itself and it will put a new entry on the call stack. And then as the procedures end, they will pop off of the call stack. This is useful. Uh, a lot of examples will have a bill of materials. Right, like how many titanium screws does it take to build a, a Cyberdyne uh, Terminator? Right, and you can go through and use recursion to, to count all the titanium screws. Another great example is a report distribution program. And here, what we have is our report distribution list, and Sales Weekly list has a couple of emails here but it can also contain an entry for another distribution list. So if we send a report to Sales Weekly, it should go to everybody here, Sales 1, 2, and 3, and everyone in the other distro list. So how does this work? We're gonna, first, we're gonna create a fake email program because again, this isn't about sending emails. We're just gonna simply log messages into a file okay, so that we can look back at it. We're going to create a procedure, again, declare proc with your procedure name and proc. We have an, an input parameter of distro list, which distribution list are we sending this to. We're going to create a couple of variables to keep track of where we are in the distribution list. And then we'll set lower limits and start reading the distro list based on whatever you sent in. Now, if this particular row is an email recipient, we simply send an email to that person. Otherwise, we're going to recursively call distribute report and send in the recipient as the parameter. So what happens as we're reading through here, we read the first record and it'll send an email to sales one. Read this one, it'll send an email to sales two. Once we get to this record and it's a distribution list, it's going to recursively call itself, and there'll be another instance of this in the call stack. 
and it's going to go through the other distro list and send an email to distro one, distro two, and distro three. It gets to the end of the file in this procedure call and will return back to the original where it sends an email to sales three and sales four. Okay, so if we call this program and we just send in the sales weekly uh, distribution list, it will send an email to sales one, sales two, distro one, distro two, distro three, and then sales three and sales four, right? Performance. So there are some performance issues that you want to keep in mind. Um, first is that these using procedures is going to be uh, have much less overhead than an external program call, right? When you have an external program call, it has to check authorities and library lists and, and go through a, a, a bunch of work in order to make that happen and that you don't have with the procedures. Um, there, there may be some instances when a procedure does not perform uh, as well as a subroutine or may even cause performance issues. The first is if you have many, 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 many calls to the procedure, right, that can add a lot of, of entries to the call stack and there is overhead with that. So like if you have a million calls, it can, can make seconds of, of difference in there, okay? If you have many, many very large local variables, that can also cause a problem because every time you call the procedure, it has to uh, create storage and initialize all of the, the, the memory for all of those local variables that you have. Okay, so this can, this can cause a problem as well. Like if you have really, really large local variables, it can become something that's noticeable. Okay. If you have very, very large return values, this can also be something uh, that that hurts your performance, right? Like returning really large strings, that sort of a thing. And now there are ways that you can uh, define your procedures where if it returns something, it can behind the scenes change it to a parameter and, and those sorts of things. So there's ways around that, but just something to be aware of, um, something that could happen uh, so if you're calling the procedures and you're having uh, performance issues, these are some things that you might want to look into. Uh, my recommendation would be to start with a procedure. And then if you're having problems, you know, you might change to a subroutine if, if the performance needs demanded um, or, or look at some other ways of, of making it perform a little bit better. Okay. And so these are the how, the superpowers that procedures have that subroutines don't, right? We talked about the input parameters and instead of relying on global variables, we can have input uh, parameters and re uh, local variables so that those variables that are defined inside of the procedure, you can be 100% sure that nothing else in your program is going to be touching those variables. They're only visible inside the procedure. In fact, if you define a variable inside a procedure and you try to use it in mainline or a different procedure, it's going to not, it won't be able to compile because it will say that it is undefined. The local variables are only visible inside of the procedures. Our procedures can return values and this can help make our code easier to understand and, and cleaner and clean, easy to understand code is going to be much more maintainable and save you lots of time and money in the long run. We also have functionality in, sub, uh, in procedure, sub procedures on exit will always be called even if something abnormally uh, ends your procedure, it will still go into the on exit code and run that in there so you can close cursors and close files, reclaim store, any, any of those things that you need to be sure always happen when you're leaving a procedure. We, we also looked at recursion and uh, being able to 
read through a bill of materials and determine, you know, how many titanium screws it takes to build a, a terminator or to have a report distribution. Your, your procedure can call itself, uh, and that is useful in, in some cases. Um, it's not a super common thing, but when you need recursion, it's really, really handy to have uh, trying to write that without being able to recursively call the program can be, you know, I, I've not been able to do it. It's uh, when, when you need it, you need it, right? Um, and the reasons why procedures are better, it reduces our reliance on global variables so that making changes is much safer, okay? We can feel more confident making changes in a procedure that's encapsulated than making changes in a subroutine where all of the variables are in global scope and shared. Right? We can have increased readability and clarity, which aids in our maintainability. You know, so if you have an execute subroutine, it's not clear what variables are used in that subroutine. What, what global variables are being changed? You have to go into the subroutine in order to find out that information. Okay, With uh, the return values, you can know exactly what's being sent back. Right? So it'll make the code more readable and, and clear, easier to understand. We have increased functionality with the recursion and on exit. Um, performance, I, I have not had any performance issues with procedures. Um, and I just kind of throw that in there more for a heads up. If you are using very, very large variables or you have you know, a very large list of input parameters into your procedure. It's something that you'll you'll have to deal with uh, with the procedures, right? And that I think is all that I have. Uh, and so I will look through the Q and A here in a minute. Um, and and that was it for that. There is the link. Uh, notice that the link to the handout is case sensitive, right? Yes, and, and John has been uh, placing, and John and I both have been putting links into the chat regularly because as people join later, they don't see the previous ones. So uh, uh, you can just click in the chat if you missed the handout when you came in, unless you come in in the last five minutes or so. Um, well, that was great. Uh, but everybody, I, I am I have a fully satisfied patron of this restaurant now. I, uh, <laughs> The procedure stuff is uh, right on. It's giving me some great ideas on ways to convince people myself uh, on that. And CNX always blows me away, but the AI stuff, oh man, it's just drooling over that one. Uh, I'm sitting here <laughs> drooling. It, <laughs> and, I so, I, Richard, I so wish I'd had that three months ago when I was uh, changing all of their valence apps for this lunch and learn stuff. Yeah, I, I have the same feeling every time I see a demo of this because I'm working with so many different customers and I'm like, I really need to get this at my customers so that I can get this job done faster, you know. Yeah, yeah. So everybody's chomping at the bit to get it and we're we're trying to get it out the door as quickly as we can. Yeah, there were a lot of a lot of people and there were some people in the chat who are already customers of yours. And of course that includes us, the system I developer. We mm -hmm. we use uh the Nitro app builder for a lot of our uh, internal apps to to manage our all the lunch and learns and all the all your registrations and things like that internally so uh, uh yeah for any of you by the way who requested uh your links because your spam filters or something blocked zoom from sending you the links and you had to write to us and uh, ask for the 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 joining links that was a valence app that actually built that spreadsheet that was sent out to you. Cool. Um, as a, one more administrative item is I did post a link to the slides that we did right before Sean did the demo. Ah. Um, and when I put it in the chat, it said it went to host and panelists. So I'm not oh. sure if everyone can see that or not. I don't know if- No, they, they can. The little, there's a little arrowhead, Richard, behind, beside the, ah. who you're sending it to, change uh -huh. it to everyone. John, you I, might have to make him a co-host to do that. I don't get the option to send to everyone. Ah, I sorry. have the low security setting. <laughs> <laughs> you, He's a panelist, you, but not, not a very powerful one. 
So, so John or Susan, maybe you guys. Try can... now. Oh, try I see. Now. Okay. okay. Now you should be able to post yes. it. Yes. Okay. There we go. All right. So I just posted it in the chat. Oh, so if anybody wants to quickly click on that to download it, or I think they'll get a follow up with the chat. I don't. I don't know. Okay. Yeah. I'm. 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 I'm going to take issue with Patrick over one teeny tiny thing, <laughs> which is uh, he was waiting for this. I know. Um. I, I agree with you that using sub procedures for performance is, is not why you should do it. Uh, the one thing that I think we tend to forget, though, when we compare them with subroutines, is that very often, if we've got a subroutine that is being used, as some of your examples are, to handle multiple different input fields, if you like, mm -hmm. there is already an overhead. It's a hidden overhead in the main code because you're not, you are referencing in the subroutine a global variable, but you've got to put the, the data in there that you want to use before you call it. Similarly, the equivalent of the return value has to be moved to where you need it from where the subroutine put it. So by the time I've actually done some tests on this, and in some cases, the sub procedure was actually faster. Hmm. There are several quote, so to speak, parameters and quotes for the subroutine that have to be set up ahead of time. It requires a few lines of code before and yeah. after. Yeah, so, so it's, it's, it's just an, it's an interesting scenario. Yeah, okay. that, it was mostly just to make people aware that if you have, you know, some of those conditions, it your your performance with a procedure it can be can be affected. But it's it's really extreme. Lots and lots and lots of of parameters are very large variables, kind of a thing. Yep. Right. Yep, there's a there's a whole bunch of questions still coming through, so we're going to uh, be a little bit here to try and uh, mm -hmm. deal with that. Susan, I don't know if you want to to wrap it up to an extent for the viewing public, and then people who are waiting for answers can hang on still. Okay, there is one um, question that was put in the chat. Should have been in Q and A, but uh, since we're in our our open mic kind of time. Uh, Joseph asked a question, how does the ab, uh, was abnormal end get set in the on exit? I think you talked about that a little bit, Patrick, but you want to reiterate that one? Right. Uh, and I, and I, I just saw one of those in the Q and A and answered it that the oh. abnormal end indicator gets automatically set for us. We don't have to do anything for you. You just define the indicator variable and that will get set automatically. If there's an abnormal end, it'll call on exit with the appropriate value. Yep. And that's because you put it, you listed that variable, that indicator name on the on the on exit. Right? On the on exit, yes, that's that's kind of a, a a parameter to the on exit call is is that indicator variable. Yes, mm -hmm. so there's basically two ways of using on exit. One is without the the variable, which just means I always want to perform this code no matter how I'm leaving. That would that would be the I've got multiple return codes and should be fl flagellated. Uh, option and then the other one as you've said is when you get an error or it'll notify you yeah yeah there's there's a couple of questions there patrick i don't know about comparing um the uh, on exit with monitor monitoring you got any comments on that uh i, I yeah so uh, Monitor would be used yeah. for when you have when you're expecting that something might happen, right? Um, so you you wouldn't want to wrap your entire procedure in a monitor statement and never get any errors. Sometimes a program ending up normally is is exactly what you want, right? If the if the product number is never supposed to be you know a a blank in a numeric field, you don't you don't want to monitor for those sorts of things, right? So the you don't monitor every single thing. You monitor things like a, a date or a number sort of a thing, right? A test numeric. There is no more test numeric. You have to use monitor for that. The on exit gives us that uh, input parameter, the, the was abnormal, to deal with things that we didn't anticipate. So monitor is used for anticipated errors. The was abnormal end is for unanticipated, oh my goodness, something really bad just happened that I wasn't yeah. expecting. Yep. Yeah. And also, also, of course, for the occasions where, like you in your examples that you talked about, sometimes it's not an error. You know, it's just stuff that needs to happen on exit, right? 
Yes. Yep. Uh, and, 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 and usually I'll have my closed cursors in there and then I can be sure that it, the cursor is always getting closed. Um, right. Nice yep. place to put those sorts of things. Uh, I need to way, just, you mentioned the dreaded test N. One of, one of the reasons test N doesn't exist anymore is it never actually worked properly. <laughs> A good reason to deprecate it. Yes. <laughs> And it sure as hell didn't work the way people thought it did. Mm -hmm. Anyway. All right. Well, we can we can hang out and uh, chat here for a little bit and see if any more questions come in. But uh, we're uh, for those people who need to get on with other things. Uh, I'll say thank you to everybody for the entire series. We've had really good results. We've had a lot of registrations and a lot of people showing up to actually watch live. And I'm sure a lot even more people will show up to uh, view the videos. Remember that you can review all the videos from our System I Developer Lunch and Learn page uh, that's shown on the bottom of this chart here. Uh, the little uh, button that you use to select it to, to register for this webinar will turn into a view recording. So you can just uh, view as many recordings there. You can just make a day of it, you know? Uh, view every Lunch and Learn uh, video you'd like. Thank you to uh, the CNX folks as our, our sponsors yet again. Uh, where it's always fun to have to work with you guys and always fascinating to see what you've got to say. And Patrick, I'm, I learned a lot about how to, how to talk about this stuff. So I'm, I'm grateful to you for that. Um, and Thank thanks you. for your support for, uh, for multiple Lunch and Learn sessions. And of course, most of all to our attendees, uh, because we wouldn't be talking to ourselves uh, if you guys weren't, weren't here. So thanks to everybody. Some of us are of an age where we talk to ourselves anyway. But... <laughs> thanks all. We'll, all hang right, take care. For, we'll hang out here and answer questions, but this gives us a chance to, uh, uh, to stop the recording at least. Or give John a place to trim the recording after, yeah, I should say. That's right, yes. <laughs> I think actually that uh, all of the real questions uh, that need answering live have, have already been done, Susan. There's a, a, a lot of yeah. what appears in questions and not actually really questions. Right. Yeah, maybe, yeah, I can just go read through. So there, there was a question about using SQL cursors in, in the recursive procedures. Uh, if I was going to use SQL in that example, I would likely just fetch into a, a data structure array and just have a single fetch to go through if I was sure that I could fit everything in there. Um, that would probably be the, the easiest, fastest way. I do like that method. Um, there's a question about how to know what stack to send to. Um, I'm, perhaps that is talking about the the program messages again, I'm not a hundred percent sure. Um, mm -hmm. There's there's usually a way you can get back to the program, it, the main program entry point itself. Yeah, that's that's covered um, within the uh, the IBM uh, introductory docs. Patrick did quite a good job of that. And if anyone wants to look up send message, the new one, uh, if you look at that on the uh, midrange.com lists. There's been some really good discussions there of how it can be used. Um, there's a question about on exit only trigger from an issue within a procedure, or does it trigger from any issue in, in the program? It is only for that particular procedure, right? Okay. Uh, can you pass a cursor to a procedure? I know you can pass a file. Um, and you can open a cursor in one place and then you have to deal with SQL locators and, and other things. It's not a technique that, that I use. Um, so I, 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 would, I would defer to, to anyone out who does that regularly. It's, it's not something that I, that I do on a regular basis. Yeah, you actually just inadvertently, I think answered one of, one of the questions about can you declare files and sub procedures? <laughs> oh yes, um, yes you can. You can declare an, an f spec and use RLA inside of your procedure. You do have to um, fetch into a data structure, though. It, everything is limited to to a data structure. 
Cut files. Oh, yep. Uh, maybe use it to declare local variables. Use to wrap several procedures with it. And mon, do you uh, monitor? And then, well, you know, it, it going. Uh, the, the next question is about monitoring and end monitoring again. And you know, it, it, it's it's akin to putting a mon message CPF zero 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 at the top of your CL program, right? <laughs> On the one hand, it will never fail. It runs <laughs> and finishes every single time. But on the other hand, if it's writing a bunch of, of gobbledygook into the database, maybe it would have been better to have the program ab end and you know, then you deal with it like, oh my goodness, something really bad is happening that we should probably take a look at. You know, again, it's monitoring for things that are that are somewhat you know, bad things that you expect to happen, right? Like it's like having an umbrella on a rainy day. You bring your umbrella if you expect it to be raining. Yeah. We were talking earlier about the the send message stuff. Anyone who wants to refer back to my what's new in RPG one in this series. Uh, monitor has now been extended with an exception, right? So, you know, there, there are other ways now of, of doing it rather than the sort of rather brute force methods that we used to use. But I, I agree with you 100%. I mean, the, the one thing that I have always hated seeing is people who write monitor and then a single on error with no conditioning whatsoever on it because what's the point, you know? Mm -hmm. it's, you might as well let the program crash and burn if all you're going to do is catch it and do nothing much. But uh, well, that's worse in a way, right? I mean, you never know what happened. And so that's true. Something that's true. may not. But have the happened. program never fails. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> well, it does, but it doesn't. <laughs> fails to perform as expected. Sorry, but... well, air, air programs never fail anybody, right? Okay. I, I think, Susan, we, sh we should probably wrap this before we get any more questions. Yeah, probably so. This can go on. <laughs> well, thank uh, you, John and Susan, for having me. Thanks, Rob, Richard, and Sean. That was, that was a really good demo. So thank you, everybody. Yeah, thank you, guys, John and Susan, especially great series. Glad that we could be a sponsor and be part of it. I'm sure we'll be back again. <laughs> and uh, Patrick, your stuff was very interesting and well presented. Thank you. Thank you. And have a good one, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Bye. Bye now. Bye. Bye.